talking today about um, using essential oils for flea and tick prevention. And then we're gonna move into a little bit about introduction to first aid. And um, I'm happy to cover any questions that you guys have about that. Um, first aid obviously is a big, big topic. And we'll just do a little bit about that today. And then as we continue the series, we'll try to add some more pieces of the puzzle um, to any questions that you guys have. I chose the flea and tick topic as one to introduce you guys to because it's one of the easiest ones to get started with, right? Essential oils can be scary <laughs> for a lot of people and we're reluctant to try and move into that because we've heard so many of the horror stories about, oh my God, you can't use any of these things for, for our dogs, which is just not true. And we talked about that in the first video. So if you've not listened to that, please go back and do that later. Um, but fleas and ticks, you know that we've talked a lot about this in the food area, right? We know that great raw food, great healthy food that is rich in vitamins and minerals and all those nutrients can be a natural improvement um, and a deterrent and that we can boost the dog with vitamin B in the summertime if we need to do that. There are things built into the dog food from Volhard that help us with some of this natural repellent. But depending on where you live and the lifestyle that you have, there are times that we may need to beef up our preventative efforts, right? I know when I first started getting into essential oils, this was the topic that I'm like, okay, I can try this because what's the worst that can happen? I can go back to um, methods that we know will work for flea and tick prevention. Um, and I'll be candid with you, I, it was a while before I even trusted the food alone, right? I lived in a very, very wooded area and we would take the dogs out into the um, woods for some walks and stuff. So we wanted some extra um, deterrence, not only for the dogs, but for ourselves. <clears throat> so when I'm making a flea and tick spray, and that's really what I do, I get one of those little small two ounce bottles and I will put drops of uh, citronella in it. Um, there's a, a blend that we use that's called a purifying blend. I'm not going to name the names, but if you're into oils already, you'll know what that means. <laughs> um, but citronella, rosemary, lemongrass, Malaleuca altifornia, which is tea tree. But you're going to see a million versions of tea tree out there. So make sure you're looking for the the botanical name and lavender and then to that we're going to add something like eucalyptus right or we're going to add in lemongrass lemongrass is one of my favorites to add to that and sort of zhuzh it up a little bit more geranium also known to help prevent and deter ticks and cedarwood excellent for deterring these animals Hi, Volhard Dog Nutrition. I don't know if that's Danae or Jennifer, but hi. Um, and then there's another, um, another plant called the Kunzia plant, which is its botanical name, its, um, its name in the, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it's called the tick plant. And it helps deter ticks from the environment in which that plant grows. So if it can do that in an environmental place, we know that it can do it when we add it as an essential oil into some of our sprays. So you don't have to use all of these oils. A lot of times people will look at my website and this list of things that I have on there, but know that there are options, right? And you can pick three or four different things, maybe things that you already have in your collection, or if you're trying to build a collection, it may be easier for you to start with a couple of those oils and work your way into growing your collection. But if you'll put 15 to 20 drops, say, of lemongrass, eucalyptus, geranium, lavender, cedarwood, 
in a two ounce bottle and then add to that something like a very cheap vodka or a little bit of distilled water or maybe some witch hazel, you then have a misting spray. And you can spray the dogs before you head out into those environments, spray yourself, um, spray your hair. So that's the beauty of these things. They work well for us and for the animals. And then you can pop that in your pocket or your backpack and take with you for a reapplication um, when you're out and about in that environment, right? So one spray is going to last you for an outing, but um, if you're going to be out for a day or so, really long hike or you're spending the night out, you'll want to take those sprays with you. So fleas and ticks can be prevented naturally. We do not need these or orals and topicals in any way. Your base will be your food, always. Food first, always. And then if the environment that you're moving out into is one that is going to be um, more natural, shall we say, than your yard, then you're going to want to do something to boost and enhance the preventative efforts. Make sure that you're treating your yard as well so I put out diatomaceous earth in my yard around all the shrubs um, and the trees and that sort of thing. But I'll also put out cedar wood oil in the yard. It is a natural deterrent in the yard area as well. And so can just planting rosemary bushes, right? Rosemary planted in your yard is very beneficial as well. Now, word of caution here, if you have a dog prone to seizures, Right? They've already experienced seizures in some way or are at risk of seizure, then we do not want to include rosemary essential oil in your blend. Okay, We don't want to make a misting spray um, that would include rosemary for those dogs that are prone to seizures. If you have an environment in which you're already infested, so to speak. And I'm hearing that very rarely these days, extremely rarely for the, the pet that lives indoors, right? I sometimes hear about it for our working animals or those dogs that live on the farm. And sometimes those environments become infested and then sometimes can get into the house I do have a protocol that is similar to what you might know as a flea bomb, right? Remember those things? I remember back when I was little and family didn't know any better, we'd set off these things inside the house and have to leave for the entire day because this fumigation was happening, right? We can do something very similar with essential oils and diffusing, though clearly it is far safer um, and without all those harsh chemicals. So if you wind up in that category, reach out and let me know and I can give you some, um, some ways to move forward. But if you go out to my website, caninecoach.dog, and just search for fleas, you're going to see um, some options there about how to create some of these misting sprays and some of the choices that you have to include in your, your um, blend, okay? Um, and the misting spray works best, I think. I'll just categorize that again. Misting spray seems to work best because I can just do a couple of little pumps across the dog's body, and that's typically all we need. We don't need to cover them. We don't need to wet them down, and we just need um, sort of head to toe. You don't want to spray it in their eyes, for example, but head to toe under their body. Um, a couple of pumps of the mist is going to be enough to help you deter that. And so when you make one of these sprays, they're going to last you a very long time unless you're a big time hiker outside all day, every day. Okay, so let's move in now to um, talking a little bit about using essential oils for first aid. So, of course, we still are going to talk about missing spray was witch hazel or cheap vodka or distilled water. Yes. So 
Last week, we talked a little bit about dilution and how to introduce your dog to essential oils, that imprint process and so on. If we find ourselves in the need of first aid, a true emergency, we're not going to care about the introductory process. We are going to get oils on that dog's body as we are headed out to the veterinarian, right? So the things that I'm telling you about are not intended to replace veterinary care in a true emergency. As you get more comfortable with essential oils, and trust me, I understand that it takes a little time to build that comfort, to see it work, to trust that process. Um, but as you get a little more comfortable, you will find that you are able to do some things at home that you don't need veterinary care for at all. But certainly if we have broken bones, traumatic bleeding, head injury, heat stroke, any of those kinds of things, um, you need to be in route to the veterinarian as you're putting essential oils on your dog. And I, I do encourage you to do both, right? I mean, to use those oils in route and to tell your veterinarian when you get there what you have used specifically. So one of the reasons for that is if you have put essential oils down into a wound to help stop bleeding and your vet goes in to start cleaning that wound and cauterize it to, to help it close up, then essential oils by definition are flammable, right? Not that it's going to set your dog on fire, right? It's not going to create an explosion like that. But it is going to create a surprise for the veterinarian if they're not told that we have put essential oils there. Um, and we'll talk about oils for bleeding in a couple of minutes, but just be transparent with them in the things that you have used in route. When we move into a first aid mode, most of us tend to move into the neat application. That means we're not spending the time to dilute anything. We are using it hardcore. We may be using quite a lot of it um, and more often than you would if you were just dealing with some sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? So crisis first aid is very different than I'm just trying to work on a couple of remedies for a bruise or for a little scrape or a cut or a burn or something, right? So those protocols are going to be different than these, these real first aid moments, right? These injury moments. So don't be afraid um, when you're doing this to move into that neat category. But I do also encourage people to keep in their first aid kit uh, little bottles. They're called dram bottles. You can find them I don't know why I didn't bring any of that stuff in here. I have a whole first aid kit, <laughs> one in the car and one in the house, right? But they're little tiny dram bottles. That's what they're called. And I can use those dram bottles to create a blend of things if I need to. And I have some misting sprays and some carrier oils and um, um, emulsifier type things like the witch hazel or the saline solution and things of that nature so that I could make a misting spray if I need to do that because sometimes I might need to spray something down into the mouth or down into that wound if um, those things are happening. So we may also want to apply things into the mouth directly and just get things on the gum line for example or drop down into the throat. So for example if I have a dog that has been hit by a car, and thankfully we don't hear about that too terribly often, but has some sort of trauma and there may be internal bleeding, then I want to get helichrysum essential oil into that dog's body. So helichrysum is for all things bleeding, right? It's going to know whether it, and this is the magic of essential oil sometimes, it's going to know whether it needs to help stop bleeding or to help bleeding flow better if something's sort of jammed up in there and not flowing properly. So um, be prepared to get things into the dog's mouth. If you can't put your fingers in there, then that's sometimes where these misting spray bottles can be extremely helpful. 
And then we also may need to do some inhalation, right? Where the dog is inhaling an essential oil and that may be from the cap. We just put the cap there, we put it on our hands and we hold our hands in front of their nose so that they're inhaling those oily constituents. I will give you an example of a first aid crisis that I had about three weeks ago. So I woke up in the middle of the night to this gasping, horrible sound, and I'm trying to figure out what it is. My dogs sleep in the bed with me, and they have since I was a little girl. And I now have a senior citizen dachshund who's probably somewhere between 18 and 19 years old. Nobody knows for sure. Um, he was entangled in the bed sheets. It was wrapped around his head and he was not getting enough oxygen. By the time I got him unraveled, I don't know how long he had been in that state, but I got him unraveled. <clears throat> he was, as my grandmother would say, limp as a dish rag. His tongue was hanging out, his gums, his tongue were sort of this dark purple, which is a sign of lack of oxygen, right? So he's trying to breathe, but he's not able to get in enough oxygen. So I put him in the sink in my bathroom because he was really hot. And I put him in where the water was running over his feet. His head's all draped out of the side of the, the, um, the sink. And I'm in that mode of, am I going to make it to the veterinarian in time or what? Because I live alone, right? And so it's like, who's going to nurse on him <laughs> if I'm driving the car? And so you're in that mode of, do I go? Do I stay? What do I do? So I put him in the sink to get some cool water running across his feet, trying to help start the cooling down process, and I came and grabbed essential oils. I grabbed frankincense and put a lot of it on the crown of his head and the back of his neck. Frankincense, use it when you don't know what else to use, right? But frankincense also helps bring oxygen to the brain. I used peppermint on his back and on his belly to help cool him down. I used eucalyptus and put the cap of the essential oil under his nose because I'm needing to do other things. So I just set the cap of eucalyptus in front of him to help try to open the passageways of his respiratory system to bring in more air, to bring in more oxygen, right? And then I used an essential oil called cypress. So the big cypress trees is where this essential oil comes from. And I learned this a long time ago. When you read a lot about some of these essential oils and their, their stories of how they originated and their purpose for use, one of the phrases has always stuck out to me as the cypress tree and therefore the oil is all about a desire to stay. I'm not ready to leave this earth, right? And so I sprinkled cypress oil all over him. Why a sprinkle? Because I know that I can do that with that essential oil especially. Um, it's part of the raindrop collection and we use a fair amount of it in trying to get that grounding, that centering, the body to sort of recognize itself again and to stay with us. So I got all those things going. I allowed him to just sort of start breathing more normally, which he did. But then he wound up having, you know how when you take a dog and the vet will turn their little feet under to see if they're aware of the positioning of their feet? He didn't move them. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, maybe we've got some brain damage or something, something going on here. And um, so I let him rest for a little while. And then I pulled out a collection of essential oils. And I know I said I wasn't going to name brands and I'm not, but this particular oil is about something called the raindrop technique. And it's nine different essential oils. And I let him sit next to me and he got those nine oils put on his back. And I did a lot of the technique where I was less concerned about the technique than I was getting the oils on him because I needed him to get his body back in sync, right? And um, he slept for about two hours and got up. I took him outside. He peed. 
he came in, he drank some water, and a couple hours later, he wanted his breakfast. I will also share with you that while he was resting, I kept interrupting that rest after the raindrop and giving him syringes of water and syringes of an antioxidant drink that has lots of enzymes and electrolytes and things in it. So I'm trying to get things down into his body as well. And he's made a full recovery. So that was one of my experiences with first aid and my little senior citizen dog. So again, don't be afraid to use NEAT and keep some supplies on your hands, uh, on hand rather. Keep in mind that essential oils have a lot of benefits to them. Many do similar things. Some do them better than others, and some do things very different. There are essential oils that we, we can talk about. So we have to be careful with this thing called compliance in the world of natural wellness, right? And you can't make claims about anything. We're certainly not here to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent anything. Again, this is not at the substitution of veterinary care, especially in an emergency, but things to use in route to. But we know that there are essential oils. You can go to um, PubMed, for example, and look for essential oils with antifungal properties, antibacterial properties, antimicrobial properties. Um, essential oils that support ligaments and bone and whatever, and you can find a boatload of information out there. So we're just gonna talk a little bit today about how some of that comes together and things that we can use the essential oils for. Couple of things as safety protocols before we do. One, remember if you have a seizure dog, we're not gonna use rosemary. So you're gonna hear me talk about that in some of these blends. Rosemary's off the table for any dog with prone to seizures. We never want to put essential oils down into your dog's ear, ever. Never drop essential oils down into the ear canal. You can use um, cotton swabs or pads or misting sprays and get all around that flappy part or the outer part, but you never want to get an essential oil drop down into the ear canal. And we need to be very careful around the eyes. Um, don't put essential oils in the eyes. If Lord knows I have done this a million times, wiping sweat while I was doing something and gotten peppermint or cinnamon <laughs> or all sorts of things into my eyes, right? But um, try not to get essential oils into your dog's eyes or your own. And then be very careful around their private parts. These, remember we've talked about like hot oils or oils that have that cool sensation. It's gonna be a surprise to them and it's not gonna feel great. And if they're already in a first aid mode, those moments we need to try to prevent. <clears throat> if you do, for some reason, find yourself where you've gotten oil into the eyes or it's too hot, it feels too hot to the animal or yourself, or you've accidentally got it into a a private part area, um, use your carrier oil. You need to keep carriers on hand in your first aid kit at all times. And so just using something like coconut oil or olive oil will help soothe that and calm it down. Never ever use water. Never use water to try and rinse off essential oils out of the eyes, or out of the private parts, water actually intensifies the feeling of an essential oil. You need a fat. So you need these coconut oil, fatty oil, carrier oil kinds of things, okay? Um, all right, so a couple of places that we can use um, essential oil. So. And feel free to ask me some of these topics and I'm happy to cover them for you. But a lot of times if your dog is transitioning foods um, or has gotten into something that they shouldn't have or a little digestive upset in some way, things like peppermint, spearmint um, can be very beneficial to soothing the digestive system. There's a reason why restaurants have peppermint candies when you leave them. Now, 
we've gotten so far away from the real peppermint in any candy that we have, right? But that was the benefit years ago that you got an authentic piece of peppermint and it was to help with the digestive system. The same is true of things like parsley. They were intended to be chewed on to help the digestive system a little bit. So if you've got a dog with just a little bit of upset, move into the areas of peppermint, spearmint, um, and you can just rub it on the belly. You could rub a little, it's gonna be spicy, so you're gonna need a carrier for this one. Um, rub it onto the gum line a little bit and let that oil help soothe the belly. So I'll usually do something like that for a couple of times throughout the day, but if we're not seeing an improvement, right? Um, if we're not getting where the dog is feeling better as a result of doing that, then of course you're gonna to need to figure out what your veterinary um, plan is going to be, right? So, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier if you have a bleeding issue, anything related to the blood, helichrysum is going to be your go-to. Now, some of you are gonna think, mm, helichrysum is kind of pricey, and it is. There's no question about it. But if you are in the kind of business that I am in, <laughs> where there is the potential for um, a dog to bite me or to bite its handler or another dog or things of that nature, it is worth it to have in my first aid kit at all times, okay? Uh, frankincense, frankincense is very helpful for, like I said, oxygenating the brain. And if you don't, if you could only have one essential oil, that might be the one that I would choose. <clears throat> it is not inexpensive either, but it is fabulous for everything. I use a lot of lemon essential oil. So in the first aid kit, putting lemon on my hands allows me to know that my hands are clean and not going to transfer any additional um, matter into the wound or the injury that I'm caring for. It allows me to get my hands super clean. It is also beneficial to the animal who can inhale the lemon to help reduce the potential for a traumatic imprint. Now, I'm choosing my words very carefully. I sort of dance around this compliance thing sometimes, so bear with me. But I'm trying to not use specific, um, some specific word. So traumatic imprint, lemon can help release the emotions that are associated with that, help release that imprint, and um, very, very cleansing to me as the first aid as the one rendering the first aid, and then also to any area. Now that's going to be one that is intense, so you're gonna need a carrier to go in with that. So Anna's asking about helichrysum, how do I apply it? Anna, I am pouring it in. I am If I've got a deep, profusely bleeding wound, or I have a dog that is um, potentially got internal bleeding, I'm chucking it in the mouth, lots of it. Um, I have, at times used an entire bottle, okay? Um, if I'm doing it sort of as part of surgical aftercare, right, where we know the process has gone well and we just need to manage the healing and keep blood flow moving to that area and the circulation of blood and stuff, then I might use a misting spray or apply it with like a salve or a balm that I've created around that area. But in a true crisis like that, where I have um, heavy duty bleeding going on, I use a lot of it. <clears throat> if I have a dog that has been stung by something, um, I am probably going to move into the lemon category again, put lemon on it. Um, and I will use things like lemongrass, citronella, lavender. I might make a little blend, put my little dram bottle, make some creation around that. Um, 
and that's going to help that stinging feel better. If I have a tick bite, right, and we need to extract that tick out of there, then I'm going to put whatever essential oil I have. <laughs> um, but ideally, it's going to be something like this purifying blend or, or lemongrass or frankincense or lavender and put right on that area. And then I'm going to move into some of my homeopathic remedies or other protocols to try and address tick bite recovery, right? Okay. We have seen, even with like ACL tears, especially the partial tear, where when we use lots of lemongrass or some of these big tree, uh, think balsam fir, cedar wood, cypress trees, spruce trees, and we do uh, an ongoing protocol that we can help those heal. But if we've got that emergency, right, it's just, it's now in pain and we need to get some care to be seen to see what it is, then we can certainly talk about things that help uh, reduce the pain. And that can be wintergreen, that could be um, copaiba, lots of copaiba. <laughs> and you're going to put those right on that area. If you can't touch that area, just use the bottle, let it drop on neat, a couple of drops, and um, use that in route to your veterinary care, right? If your dog has had um, some sort of poisoning, one, you all need to know how to make dogs throw up, right? We do that with um, hydrogen peroxide. If you if you need to get to the vet, and try, I've done it, <laughs> right? I've done it. My dog found rat poison at my mother's house once. I, I mean, I'm like, why do you even have this? I, I didn't know it was there. So, of course, I'm getting them to vomit. You don't know which dog has ingested it. You just see this empty package on the floor. So, I'm taking three dogs to the emergency vet. And they, of course, get the charcoal treatment and all that kind of stuff as well. But then even when I come back home now, I want to support the liver, right? Anytime we've been exposed to anything that is potentially um, what Dr. Jody calls an insult to the liver, then we need to take care of that, right? And so many times we will think of milk thistle. And I trust me, I have milk thistle in my first aid kit as well. But helichrysum is another great one. Um, lime helps support and cleanse the liver. Actually, lime and helichrysum can help chelate out heavy metals from the body. So I keep those things on hand. And when, when and if we ever have an experience, then I'm usually doing some type of protocol that will last anywhere from three to four weeks after, depending on how severe things may have been. It might even be something that I do on a longer basis. If you have a dog that overheats, peppermint. So I just described that to you with my own dog and he was in the house. So if you go out with a dog that's an athlete and you run with them or you're in some of these performance sports, peppermint is great to keep on hand. And what you can do is just sprinkle down the back, sprinkle on the head, again, never around the eyes, and then take a cool towel and lay on top. And let the cooling sensation of those essential oils start to cool down that body while other first aid may be taking place. I've done that many, many times, um, even for dogs that I don't know <laughs> that you see out at the park or... Um, you know, different environments or different events that are overheating. We can support the eyes. Now, I'm going to tell you, anytime you have something going on with the eyeballs, you need to go to the vet. This is not something that we guess at what's going on. But um, we can help with eye care. And, and, and I'm going to show you. What I'll do is take, like, frankincense and put the drops of essential oil into the little middle of my hand and then just cup 
that hand over that eyeball, right? So the oil is not touching the eye in any way, but sort of the vapors are, if you will. And the eye is going to receive some of those constituents in there. You could also do a swipe of essential oil like frankincense. It's super gentle, which is why this is the one to use but a little swipe under the eye or over the eye. Even if you've got an injury or the, the dog that's winking at you and you got this oozy thing going on or this, um, um, you know, the tear ducts are happening and you don't know what's going on, but you need to get to the vet, the swipes of frankincense or the cupping can help with the reduction of inflammation. You can use Copaiva in the same way. There's actually a protocol that we use for humans even, and I've done it with my dog, Howie, who, the one that's old. So years ago, he lost an eye to glaucoma. And it was said that he was gonna have to have eye drops in the other eye for the rest of his life. Well, you know me, <laughs> what else can I use? Is there an alternative? And there are actually some protocols of making um, basically a roller ball. If you, if you know what a roller ball is, it looks like a little chapstick. It's got a little roller on the end and you use it to roll around and get those oils in there. So you make this blend and you put it in a, in a roller ball and you can just swipe it under the eye or over the eye. And we can use oils like frankincense, rosemary, cypress. Um, you can combine them all with a carrier and now just use that as a little swipey thing around that eye as needed or, you know, until a certain area of the eye has healed. Um, I could talk about many other topics. <laughs> what would you guys like to cover? Anything? Anything in the first aid issue? If not, um, We'll, we'll maybe look at some more first aid next time. My goals are to talk about uh, essential oils with puppies, essential oils with senior dogs, um, you know, certain ailments, shall we say, and the ways that we can use essential oils um, in, in sort of those recovery areas as well. But let me just stop and see if you guys have any questions before we move on. Oh, sorry, I needed to scroll down. If I have a dog that keeps getting a rib out, so there's itching in that area and is uncomfortable, yeah, I would use oils that help. Is it painful, do you think? I mean, you described it as itching, but do you think it's more pain and inflammation? Because I think what I would do is look at, um, I think I would look at oils that support the bones themselves. And I'll look those up in just a second. I don't have them up. Yeah. So bone injury would be helichrysum, peppermint, maybe wintergreen, make a blend. Um, you could make a blend and use it neat, just a drop or two, and um, see if that helps the bone itself, right? I mean, I've seen people heal bones more quickly than it might have otherwise. If you think it's itching, like, like legit itching, um, then I would probably be using th more things like Copaiba, lavender, frankincense, maybe a little tea tree and create something that is more soothing to the skin than comforting to the bone. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. There are essential oils that do different things. So it's kind of figuring out which it may be. Let's see, Anna says, Frank and Lavender use the same way for cupping the eye. Yeah, that's where it started, Anna, right? I mean, we're, we're mostly applying what we've learned with people to our animals. 
and foot soaks with Epsom salts are great for cuts. It, I think that depends on maybe, so I don't disagree. I use Epsom salts a lot even for skin issues, right? And we're not using brand names here. So um, I use, like if I've got a dog that comes to me with really bad allergies and I'm going to start working on maybe a liver cleanse with them or the allergy protocol as I transition them to the Volhard food, there's a time that they are likely to flare up worse in their allergies than before they heal, right? The bad stuff got to come out somehow. And it may come out as, as a flare up of the skin because the skin is our really our largest um, waste management organ, detox organ. But after the liver does its work, then it's going to the skin. So I do a lot of Epsom salt soaks for that purpose as well. If I'm dealing with, it depends on the severity of the wound or the severity of the cut and whether I need to keep things dry or not. So I don't disagree that we can use them for um, soaking feet. I use, I use Epsom salts to soak for detox foot baths after dogs have been out in the environment and maybe picked up things that, that we wish they had not been exposed to, you know, so there's a whole lot of opportunity for that. You might have already said this, but just to reiterate, if they get a cut, can you use helichrysum knee? Yes, absolutely you can. And so the short version of that is you would want to use it until the bleeding stops. And then you're going to move into maybe uh, using helichrysum in a dilute form or added to a blend of some sort or added to some sort of um, salve or ointment or things of that nature. So, for example, if I have a dog that has had a surgical procedure, right, and I need to care for that wound, I don't want to touch that wound myself for several days. So I might use a misting spray for that purpose. And I'm going to, in that case, use very cheap vodka because the vodka is going to flash off and dry pretty quickly. So I've, I'm using these, um, like the vodka, as a way to get the molecules of the essential oil to attach to something and spray out of that bottle, right? and to dilute it a bit, because I don't need much, but I don't want to touch that area. And I may then put um, an ointment that I've zhuzhed up with a whole bunch of essential oils in an area around that, right? Because I don't want to touch that incision. And the same is true for a cut. I may not want to touch it. And, but if I can get things in that area, then they're going to penetrate into the skin and go do the things they do where they need to work the best. And then as things start to heal, once I know that incision is very well closed up or um, maybe the stitches have come out and I'm not at risk of, of making it rip open again, then I'm going to start working on the scar. And I'll put things directly on that to help that scar tissue improve and be minimized as well. Other questions? So my suggestion for those of you not yet using essential oils, get started. <laughs> they are fabulous and they're a fabulous way to incorporate into your natural wellness lifestyle with the Volhard food, right? Food first, always. It's been that way for me since day one. And then for these one-off scenarios or these things that we're trying to work on, build yourself a first aid collection. That's one of the easiest ways to get started. Fleas and ticks are easy to start, right? Because the worst that can happen is you go, it's not working, which I will never believe, <laughs> right? But you go, okay, I'm going to go back to what we've been doing. And there's really no harm, no foul, right? 
but you're going to see it work. And then you're going to be like, okay, what else can it work for? And then if you try it for the upset stomach or the dog crashed into the fence and bruised his arm and you put some helichrysum or some wintergreen on it, or you see a friend who's using essential oils to help um, a ligament heal, right? And you start seeing these things where you're like, oh, I burned my finger. Let me go grab some lavender. And you drop some lavender on it and it's not hurting anymore. You're like, oh, well, what else can I use it for? And then you think, okay, now my dog got stung by um, a, a, a bee or you get bit by a mosquito or whatever. And you start seeing these small moments work. You start seeing these small moments work. Then you're like, well, what else can I use it for? And then that's where we're going to get into these emotional roots, right? We talk, a, most people think about essential oils in this emotional category. We're definitely going to talk about that. But there are things with essential oils that if your dog, and we're going to have to be careful about how we publish this publicly, but um, like on the YouTube channel and all. But if your dog has had a tough diagnosis of some sort, there are essential oils that you can bring into the wellness regimen. I can't guarantee you anything. Nobody can with any protocol, right? But we can bring in some essential oils to do things in some extremely powerful ways. I have seen <clears throat> resolution to issues where traditional approaches didn't work where people thought i don't even know what else to try we've tried everything well if you haven't tried essential oils no you haven't try them and let's see what's possible but we also get into a situation every once in a while where somebody is so desperate that <clears throat> they come and say all right i want to try this and i'm like wow we are late in the game right we're very late in the game so being proactive is super important. So I encourage you to just get started. Just start to see the possibilities and the potential and get into some of these educational groups where we can talk in richer ways, more openly, a little more openly about how we are all using essential oils, right? That's where you're gonna learn the most. What would I use for scar tissue support? Um, I will have to look at my notes, Dana, or, or sorry, Danae, and figure, and I'll let you know. I'll apply here. But to your to your question about is scar tissue something that could cause itching? Hundred percent. And we also have to remember, and we've heard Wendy. Well, for those of you who've never heard Wendy speak in person, you might not have heard her say this. But everywhere there is a scar. There is a meridian point and it has now been interrupted. So the energy of the body does not flow through its natural path when it hits a piece of scar tissue. It has to stop or be rerouted, right? So these interruptions are a very big deal in some cases, especially depending on the significance and the, the size of the scar and the tissue that is damaged underneath. So sometimes, for example, when we see a dog gnawing in an area, it could be that they are trying to stimulate that area, right? To stimulate energy flow or even to, it's painful in some way and they're trying to help that out, right? Um, but yeah, so scar tissue is a big deal. Scar tissue changes the natural energetic flow of what's known as qi in Chinese medicine. So at minimum, I would start, Danae, with frankincense, copaiba, lavender, but I'm pretty sure that I have a couple of notes on other things that will help um, maybe soften that scar tissue a bit. So I'll look those up. Anybody else have questions? 
All right, friends. Well, I'm going to let you go. I appreciate you joining me today. And again, I very much apologize for missing the 1130 start time. We're going to try to do these this, the first and third Friday of each month and, and focus on some essential oil topics as we go. And um, maybe then we can also add in some homeopathic discussions or, or other topics that are all about holistic wellness. That's, that's my goal is that whatever works, <laughs> whatever we can use to keep our dogs healthy for as many years as possible, I want to be doing that. <clears throat> can you, you can absolutely use frankincense neat 100% of the time. 100% of the time. It's a very gentle essential oil. All right, everybody, have a fabulous weekend. I'll talk to you guys soon.